Right now, we are back with some more of the Fat Electrician. This time, most comical invasion ever. How America captured Guam without landing a single shot. I'm here for it. Guys, I'm absolutely loving this Fat Electrician deep dive that we're doing. Much love. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe for more of this type of content. Without any further ado, let's bring up Nick and let's see what he's got for us. Most of my videos are done on stories that I think would make great movies, and this one's really no different, except this one should be a Mel Brooks-style comedy. No way. Today we're talking about the chillest, most nonchalant invasion of all time, when America acquired Guam, or when America acquired <laughs> Guam the first time. The story Hell takes yeah. place in 1898 during the Spanish-American War. Now, most people know almost nothing about the Spanish-American War, so real quick, oversimplified version of what's going on. America is basically the new kid on the block trying to establish itself as a world power, and the Spanish Empire has been struggling for a long time. And for the three years leading up to this, the Spanish colony of Cuba has been leading a revolution trying to kick out the Spanish. And America has been backing this revolution pretty much from the start for a couple of reasons. One, America at this point in time just doesn't like European colonial powers being anywhere near them whatsoever and two if they can beat up on the spanish and make them kind of forfeit their empire hopefully it'll create a power vacuum and america can fill that thus becoming a world power because of that america starts sending warships over to cuba to protect american interests aka they were probably giving a bunch of guns and ammo to the cuban revolutionaries to fight off the spanish then on february 15th 1898 a u.s warship the uss maine blows up inside the harbor in havana killing 268 american sailors wow. and sinking to the ocean floor now as we all know this is like the biggest cardinal sin on the planet fucking with america's boats the problem is we don't know who fucked with the boat necessarily so the u.s government and the u.s media get together and they're like well if we don't actually know who did it we're just going to blame it on whoever is most convenient for us that being the spanish because we want to go to war with them so that's what they do the u.s media pushes it out to the american people that the uss maine was sunk by the spanish oh the my american God. people are now pissed off and now america declares war on spain now to be completely fair the sinking of the uss maine is still controversial to this day it has been investigated and studied and theorized to death at this point. I think the Spanish government, the American government did investigations right after it happened. The American government then did another investigation like 10 years later. Then they did another investigation in the 1970s. And then National Geographic has done an investigation. Wow. And it all comes down to nobody actually knows what happened, but there's two going theories. Theory number one, and the one that I believe in the most, is that it was an internal explosion, meaning that it was more than likely an accident, and the American government just took advantage of the accident as an excuse to enter that, the war. Yes, so why do I 100%. I, I believe that. I believe that. Because of of how like cautious we are with our with our boats, with our fleets, you know, like that makes sense. It's just a hey, don't drop that, Jim. Oops, and then kaboom. And then some someone's head had to roll. Right? Like that's just that makes sense. I don't know why it makes so much sense. But yeah, definitely definitely not um definitely not a uh an outside job i it doesn't sound like it you know it's too convenient but anyway well, i believe that well it's occam's razor the simplest answer is probably the correct answer the uss maine is a coal burning ship coal is combustible and it emits methane which is a flammable gas and it's also full of black powder to be able to shoot the guns and it's parked inside of a port of a country that is world renowned for its cigars okay it's probably one big accident and the crew fucked up blew it up now theory number two in this is where all the conspiracy theories come in it was an external explosion meaning that it had to have been an underwater mine meaning that somebody had to have deliberately blown up the uss maine now there's three parties involved and it would have had to have been one of those three obviously right it a was spain blowing up an american ship for supporting the cuban revolution it b was the cubans knowing that america would assume that it was spain so that america would join in and help them in the revolution or c it was america blowing up its own ship in a false flag operation to have an excuse to enter the spanish american war wow. now out of those three obviously a the spanish did it is what the american government went with at the time you know so they could enter the war because they wanted to basically using it as an excuse or maybe they actually thought that who knows b nobody actually actually really believes the cubans did it that's just i don't know like an offshoot theory <laughs> c that america launched a false flag operation is a very trendy conspiracy theory that all kinds of people including history teachers that i have had have went out and said now i'll be very clear about this 
There's zero fucking evidence to support this theory. <clears throat> Absolutely none. Oh, that's not true because it's actually the Cuban government's official stance that America did blow up the USS Maine. And even the statue in Havana honoring the USS Maine says that the crew were victims to imperialist greed. Oh. Yeah, and the Cuban government has no evidence to back that up, meaning that it's just an opinion. And guess what? I don't give a flying fuck about the opinion of the communist government of Cuba. And neither should anybody else because when you have over a million people that flee your country by any any means necessary, and I mean any means necessary. They're making their own boats. There's people that are hang gliding all the way to Florida. When you have people willing wow. to do that, to get away from your government policies, maybe, just maybe you have bad ideas. I mean, literally hundreds of thousands of people have left in a singular year to go to Florida, okay? Florida has more Cuban refugees than Wyoming has people. Wow. Ugh, you're so stupid. If you would open a book once in a while, maybe you would know that Cuba is a communist utopia. They have free healthcare and a 99% <laughs> literacy rate. Buh. Oh, so you're telling me all the smart, healthy people that were in Cuba looked around and said, yeah, fuck this, I'm moving to Florida. Maybe they were onto something. Okay, look, all I'm saying is I've never once heard of a Cuban refugee making it all the way to America and then getting told by some communist college student with skittle colored hair, oh, hey, but you know how to read and there's free healthcare over there. And they're like, oh, fuck, you're right. I should go back. That's never happened. Buh. Um, well, uh, well, the only reason that Cuba doesn't do that great is because America has an embargo on them. Buh. An embargo just means that America doesn't trade with you, okay? America's one nation, Cuba's one nation. There's 195 of them on the planet. Try doing business with one of the other 193. Okay, look, all I'm saying is it's really hard to claim to be the superior way to run the world when you can't get along without the capitalism there, okay? Right now, it's the geopolitical equivalent of a 20-year-old kid still living at home that's mad at mom and dad for making him get a job, and now he can't pursue his dream of being a Twitch streamer. Okay, because it's <laughs> Strictly speaking, that's the only way that communism works is when capitalists are funding it. And if you don't believe me, we can look at all the communist nations on the planet. Okay, there's five of them. You got North Korea, Cuba, Laos, Vietnam, and China. The only two that you can see from outer space at night are Vietnam and China. And I'm sure it's just a coincidence that they're also the only ones that have a McDonald's and a KFC on every fucking block. <laughs> okay, I'm calm. I'm calm. What was this video about? <laughs> Boy. Uh, hey, Brandon Herrera. And you have, oh my God, who's that guy in the back? The angry, angry cop? Is that angry? I forgot. But yeah, I like the pictures in the back. Awesome. Hey, hey, by the way, Brandon Herrera, Herrera, like, almost got into political office, if you guys know that. That's, check out the unsubscribe podcast, for real. It's, it's a pretty interesting, it's pretty entertaining, to say the least. Anyway, guys, yeah, Nick and communism. Don't, don't, don't mention communism to Nick at all. He'll just go off on a tangent. That escalated quickly. <laughs> it jumped up a notch. It did, didn't it? Sorry, the USS Maine, very controversial. Regardless, it gets blown up. America uses that as the excuse or the reason to enter the Spanish-American War, declaring war on Spain. So one of the first things that America does is they get a hold of Commander George Dewey. He is the man that is in charge of America's Asiatic fleet, and they are currently stationed in Hong Kong. They go ahead and they give them the order, hey, take the Asiatic fleet from Hong Kong, sail it over to the Philippines, go into Manila Bay, and take the entire thing over, because the Philippines at this point in time is a Spanish colony. So that's exactly what George Dewey does. But before he leaves Hong Kong, he decides he is going to enlist the help of a man by the name of Emilio Alguinaldo, who is currently exiled in Hong Kong because several years prior, he had just led an entire revolution against the Spanish in the Philippines. Hmm. Now, obviously, you do not see exactly where this is going because America's never, ever done anything like this, ever. You know, the definitely not a classic move where we encourage a guerrilla fighting group to overthrow its current government and then... We end up fighting that guerrilla fighting group like 10 years later, and it's just way worse overall. Yeah. Anyways, yeah, that's basically what happens. Dewey shows up to Manila Bay with the Asiatic fleet. He takes over the bay almost immediately, at which point he sends Emilio ashore. He gathers up some revolutionaries, and they're going to start fighting the Spanish way before the American troops ever even set foot on the ground. Now, at this point, something unexpected happens. The German and the Japanese Navy show up pretty much for the same reason America's there. They also would like to own the Philippines. So now George Dewey just does not have enough men to go around because he has to keep all his men on the boats, potentially ready to fight the Germans and the Japanese in naval warfare if they want to do that. And now he doesn't have any American soldiers to go ashore and help out the guerrillas. So Dewey does the only thing he can do. He requests reinforcements and it takes about three weeks for those reinforcements wow. to even start heading his way. Captain Henry Glass is going to be departing from California in a U.S. cruiser known as the Charleston and he is going to make his way over to Hawaii where he is going to pick up and escort three troop transports completely full of American soldiers and that is who is going to go ashore and fight the Spanish 
Spanish in Manila. So that's what he does. He goes to Hawaii, picks up the troop transports, and while he's there, he is given a sealed letter with orders directly from the Secretary of the Navy that he is only supposed to open once he gets underway and out of sight of Hawaii. It's a secret mission in a charted space. Let's go! So now Henry Glass and the men of the Charleston are pumped. They get to go on a super duper top secret mission. So they get out in the open ocean, open up this letter directly from the Secretary of the Navy, and here's what it says. I'm not going to read all that. I'm just going to go ahead and summarize it for you. It essentially says, hey, on your way to Manila, make a quick pit stop in Guam and take it over real quick. It should only take you a day or two. Chop, chop, hurry the fuck up. So now the crew is super pumped. I mean, they wanted <laughs> combat and they just got orders to speed run an entire invasion and take over of another country while they're on their way to go invade and take over <laughs> another country. It's like putting bacon bits on bacon. These guys love it. So the crew starts getting ready. They go and they dig through all the maps and books on the ship, trying to find out anything and everything they can about Guam. And according to the latest intel, granted, it's a couple years old, but damn it, it's the newest intel we've got and we've got to go off of it. There's going to be a Spanish warship there and a couple of forts guarding Guam. It is going to be a fierce fight and we need to get ready for it. So they start training. They start taking barrels, empty crates, anything they can spare and throwing it overboard. And once it drifts a couple hundred yards away, they open fire on it with the guns for target practice. And this goes on the entire time. And then finally, June 20th, 1898, they arrive at Guam. It is early in the morning. They're going to attack at first light. 6 a.m. is when they are going to sail in and launch their assault. So it's early morning. It's foggy. The whole crew's on edge. They're ready for combat at any moment. And they're just coming up on Guam and they're coming up on Guam and Finally, through the fog, they can make out a ship. It's got to be the Spanish warship, right? It's guarding Guam, and they get closer and closer. And right as they're about to open fire on this ship, it's a Japanese merchant vessel. <laughs> okay, that's weird, but I mean, what, what are you going to do? Just keep advancing, I guess, right? That ship and those forts got to be in there somewhere. So they keep advancing through the fog, and they keep advancing, and they keep advancing. And finally, they start to see the silhouette of one of the forts off in the distance through the fog. But the problem is, is the fort is built directly onto a cliff face, and it's so high that the guns on the ship aren't going to be able to actually fire at it. Well, now we've got a fucking problem, because the sun is fully out, and this fog is getting thinner and thinner by the second. So we're going to have to haul ass and try to get out of range of this fort as soon as possible. So that's what they do. They haul ass through this fog trying to get out of range of this fort and they do it. They don't get fired on a single time. They made it through. Hooray. So now it's like broad daylight out and they roll up on this second fort and this fort they're going to be able to hit with the guns. It's finally go time. We get to show off our expert marksmanship. So they roll up and they just start bombarding this fort with fire. They shoot at this fort like 13 times, missed every single time, and they got zero return fire from the fort. The entire crew is just completely confused. What the fuck is going on? I come here for a shootout, right? Yeah, me go on, get out. Go on, off. A shootout, right? It's a fucking shootout. So everybody looks at the captain like, hey, Captain Glass, what are we gonna do? And he's like, I, I, I don't know. I guess we'll get ready to go ashore and take over Guam on foot. <laughs> I guess nobody wants to fight us on the water, apparently. So start getting the whaling boats ready. Get your kit on. We're going to go do this. So that's what they do. The whole crew starts getting ready. And while they're getting ready, they start to notice that there's a bunch of people amassing on the beach that they need to go to. So they're like, oh shit, this is going to go down. We're going to get in a fight on foot on this beach. Fucking it's go time. So they're getting their guns and their kit ready. You know, the intro scene to every military movie ever right before the big mission is going on at this exact moment. And right then a little tiny boat full of a bunch of Spanish guys rolls up and boards their ship. And and the first thing the Spanish guys say are, hey, sorry, we didn't return the salute. We didn't have any black powder or guns ready to do that. And the Americans are like, what? What are you talking about? And they're like, the, the salute you did earlier where you like fired when you passed the port, you know, to salute us as a, as, as a courtesy. And the Americans are like, no, dude, we're at war with one another. We just can't fucking aim, apparently. Come to find out, apparently Spain had just neglected to inform Guam that they were in fact at war with America. And this is horrible for the Spanish at this point because, well, the boarding party was actually like the welcoming committee slash customs and more or less they were just coming out to the american ship to apologize for not saluting and then make sure the americans weren't about to bring any illegal contraband or diseases onto the island and let them know the rules of the land and it ends up being a humongous issue for the spanish in hindsight because this welcoming committee was pretty much comprised of almost all of the spanish officials on the island oh like the entire spanish government present was pretty much on that welcoming committee with the exception of the governor and the treasurer and then there was like one other dude that wasn't part of the government, but he was the biggest merchant on the island. His name was Francisco Portash, a.k.a. Frank. Uh, so they have basically just inadvertently turned over the entire government right off the bat. So at this point, Captain Glass is like, well, this is 
fucking perfect. And he picks like the two lowest ranking guys, writes a letter to the governor and is like, hey, surrender. I have, I've captured all of your government officials and I have more men than you do. Why don't you just go ahead and call it a day? We don't need any violence whatsoever. They go off and they're going to hand deliver that letter to the governor. So while they're going to deliver that letter, the other ones are still talking with Captain Glass and come to find out Frank the merchant is actually an American. He was born in Spain. He migrated to America in Chicago where he became a U.S. citizen. Oh my God. His wife married her, moved to San Francisco, became an elevator technician and then for some reason got a wild hair up his ass moved to guam and became the most successful merchant there and to be honest he's pretty pumped that america's taken over because he likes america more than he likes spain so he is still more than happy to help captain glass any way he can That's and he's like awesome. hey here's the deal just tell me what you want let me go back me and the boys will start ferrying out whatever supplies you need and we'll just sell it to you right here you won't even have to go ashore so captain glass is like perfect he lets frank take one of his boats back he gets his men and they just start shuttling back and forth boatloads and boatloads of supplies for all the Americans to buy. And this is like my favorite part of the story because it's just one of those things that you read and you're like, yep, that's too stupid to not be true. One of the Americans wrote in their journal and I quote, Francisco's men sold fruit at astonishingly low prices. You could buy three bananas, two mangoes, and a pineapple for one cent. But one of the live monkeys cost two whole American dollars. It just goes to show you war changes, but the men that fight it never do, because that's the most grunt shit I've ever heard in my uh, entire life. Okay, now cut back to the two dudes delivering the letter of surrender to the governor. We'll call them Bob and Tom, okay? Bob and Tom make it ashore. They start walking over to the governor's palace. They get about halfway there, and they notice that there's like 20 dudes pushing six brass cannons from the governor house down the side of the road and bob and tom look at each other and they look at these guys and they're like holy shit are we actually going to try to fight the americans and the guys pushing the cannons are like what no we're just bringing these over from the governor's palace so we can return the salute to the americans and bob and tom are like i just don't worry about it just put the cannons back god damn it so they just keep going they get to the governor's palace they give him the terms of surrender at which point the governor's furious but also i mean what's he gonna do he's got 54 spanish soldiers and then guam has a militia of 52 guys with no training he doesn't stand a chance he basically has to surrender. But here's the catch with this whole thing. Captain Glass's letter to the governor actually instructs the governor basically to just hop on a boat and report to the American vessel and turn himself in. And that's not going to fly with the governor. So he writes a letter back that has to get delivered to Captain Glass. And that letter says, and I quote, it would give me great pleasure to comply with his request and see you personally. But as the military laws of my country prohibit me from going aboard a foreign vessel, I regret to have to decline this honor and ask that you will kindly come ashore where I await to exceed your wish as far as possible and to agree to our mutual situations asking your pardon for the trouble I cause you and I guarantee your safe return to your ship very respectfully Governor Juan Marina. Okay, so obviously this is a trap, right? The government's planning something. That's a stupid rule. Nobody would actually follow that. So the Americans get this letter, they read it, and Captain Glass is like, It's undoubtedly a trap. Okay, so now the Americans fill up one whaling boat with Captain Glass and a bunch of soldiers, and then another whaling boat just completely full of soldiers. Captain Glass and his boat are going to go ashore, where they're ideally going to accept this surrender, <laughs> but it's probably a trap. And then that other whaling boat is going to wait right offshore in case they need reinforcements for when shit goes down. But to the American surprise, the governor shows up with his 54 soldiers and then his 52 militia members, and he just straight up surrenders. So they take the governor as a POW, they take all the weapons away from the Spaniards, they take all of them as POWs, then they take all the weapons from the militia and then they're just kind of like ah you guys are from here go ahead and go home we're just going to take the weapons get out of here at this point the governor is like oh hey by the way i wasn't able to find my treasurer jose six toe i have no idea where he is do you want me to send a search party to go find him so you can take him as a pow too at which point captain glass is like i mean this is a giant waste of my time, to be honest with you. No, I don't care. Let's just get everybody on the ship so I can leave. So they get everybody back to the ship. That's Captain awesome. Glass then takes a handful of Americans and sends them out to the fort that they had originally fired on, and they are instructed to fly the American flag over Guam because it is now a U.S. colony. So those guys grab a flag, hop in a boat, and they start sailing out to the fort. While that's going on, Captain Glass is telling everybody what happened. He's like, yeah, it wasn't an ambush. They actually did just straight up surrender. We took the governor as a POW. We took his 54 men as POWs, and then he had... He had 52 militia members, but they were from Guam, so we just took their weapons and let them go home. At which point, one of the original guys from the welcoming committee, you know, the Spanish government, hears that, and he's like, whoa, 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 technically I was born here, I'm super duper Spanish, but I was born in Guam, can I go home too? At which point, Captain Glass is like, yeah, fuck it, why not, go ahead. Then Captain Glass looks over to Frank, the merchant, who's still there trying to sell as much stuff to the Americans as possible before they leave, and he's like, Frank, you're technically the only American here, I'm not gonna leave any of my guys behind to run this place, so... You're in charge, I guess. Now get off my boat and take 
not Spanish, Spanish Guam guy with you. So Frank, his men, and the government official dude that's apparently from Guam all hop in their little boats and they go back over to Guam. By this point, the Americans have the flag flying over the fort. Captain Glass orders them to fire the cannon as a salute. And then the Americans start lowering the flag. And Captain Glass is like, these idiots are going to take the flag back with them and we're going to colonize an entire island and then we're not even going to leave a flag there so nobody knows that it's our territory. A little while after that the American detail shows back up in their whaling boat with the American flag in hand at which point Captain Glass is like why? Why on earth would you take the flag down? And they're like oh shit I didn't even think about that. You want us to run back over there and hang it up? And Captain Glass is like no no I don't just get get in the ship we're leaving. Just the complete dad energy of like no get your ass in the car we're going to Manila. And that's it they bounce. Just the most nonchalant ridiculous invasion slash capture of any territory ever. Okay, zero uh, bloodshed. The Americans rolled up, captured the entire government, captured the entire military, put nobody else back in charge other than some random dude claiming to be an American that's named Frank. And then they didn't even give him like documentation or anything. Just literally uh, gave him the verbal, hey, you're in charge now. So Frank is literally just showing back up on the beach in a boat being like, hey, the teacher said I get to be the line leader, motherfuckers. Beautiful morning. <laughs> Keep it running. Uh Okay, if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you that I believe this is the first time that America created a gigantic power vacuum and then just left it completely unsupervised. But not to worry, I'm almost positive that America is going to learn from this mistake the first time and will never, ever do it again. <laughs> you will be punished for your decadent ways on the first day of Radaman. You... <laughs> wait, wait a minute, wait, did I just say, what did I say, Radaman? Rad blah, 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 blah. Okay, for real though, I need you guys to fully grasp how crazy this situation is for Guam, okay? Imagine that you woke up tomorrow and the American government was gone. The cops, gone. The military, gone. Nobody knows what happened and there's just one dude named Frank that said, hey, Joe Biden put me in charge. Fucking what? What's your response to that, sir? <laughs> you know what? No, I'm going to be optimistic. This is this is going to go great. This is a recipe for success. So Captain Glass and the Americans make their way over to Manila. They're going to reinforce Dewey. They show up and honestly, they're probably not even really needed as far as overthrowing the Spanish goes because Emilio went ashore. He started an entire revolution all over again and they have been laying siege to Manila for weeks at this point. So the Spanish government knows that they're gonna have to surrender. There's no way they can win this now, but they would way rather surrender to America because America is a world power and they don't wanna have to surrender to a local revolution because that would be bad for their colonial empire street cred. So the Spanish leadership of Manila goes to Admiral Dewey and they're like, hey, hear me out. We wanna surrender just to American forces. So we have to get in a battle with just American forces. We're proposing that we have a fake mock battle for funsies. We'll like choreograph it. We won't load our guns. It'll just be for show and we'll surrender only to American forces and keep our reputation intact. And you guys get to take over Manila. What do you say? The Americans obviously agree because not dying is cool. And that's what <laughs> yeah. they do. They have this enormous mock battle and nobody has loaded guns. And obviously nobody told the guerrilla fighters because well, that was the entire point. And then some of them joined in and their guns definitely were loaded. And 49 Spanish soldiers ended up getting shot. And then the Spanish started returning fire because they didn't know what was going on. So then six Americans got shot and killed. But other than that, the mock battle was kind of successful, I guess. Yeah, I stabbed a man in the heart. I saw <laughs> Break. That. Brick killed a guy. Yeah. Uh. Horses and a man on fire. So the Spanish surrendered, America takes over Manila, and the Spanish-American War would be concluded in December of 1898, and that would end with America now having Guam and Puerto Rico as colonies, and then they would also purchase the Philippines from the Spanish for $20 million. And needless to say, Emilio Aguinaldo, the Filipino revolutionary, is fucking furious, you know, by the whole yeah. lack of Filipino independence and whatnot. Understandably so. Which pretty much immediately leads into the Philippine-American War that started like a month later in February of 1899 and the whole thing is just a timeless American classic. America gets guerrillas to do the dirty work for them, guerrillas overthrow government, now America has to fight the same guerrillas. It's History repeats itself. Tale as old as time. The focal point of the story, <laughs> Guam. Last time we heard about them was June 21st, 1898, when Henry Glass left. Nobody's been there since, okay? An American vessel finally pulls up on January 1st, 1899. And when the Americans got there, the island was literally on the brink of civil war. Like, they were standing there with guns, ready to open fire on one another, when they noticed the American vessel pulling up and they decided to postpone till tomorrow. So the Americans show up and they start trying to figure out what's 
what's going on. Both sides of this seemingly about to break out civil war plead their case. And essentially, when Frank showed back up to the beach and said, hey, I'm in charge now, some people didn't really give a fuck. Imagine that. And the one person that cared the least was actually the treasurer that got left behind, which makes sense. He was the last person part of the Spanish government. So in his perspective, he probably should have been in charge. Unfortunately, <laughs> he was also the only person that had keys to the treasury, and he made the executive decision that he was going to go ahead and give him and all of his buddies an 18-month advance on their salary, basically bankrupting the entire country. So because wow. Jose and all of his buddies had all the money, they basically had all the power and they were essentially in charge. And this went on for a little while. And then eventually Frank and some of the other people there got mad and started a pro-America group and things started to escalate and escalate and escalate. And eventually war was about to break out and then the Americans finally showed back up. So the Americans audit the treasury, determined that Jose did in fact steal all the money. They order him to pay it back. And then the American captain appoints a man by the name of Joaquin Perez to be the governor. He picks out his own cabinet and now Guam actually has a government. At which point the American ship captain basically informs the new Guam government that they are under the authority of the United States Navy. Anything that was Spanish lands is now American lands. And other than that, here's your American flags. We're gonna fucking dip out. And then the Americans left again. They don't hear anything for a couple more months. Then randomly another American ship shows up, but they go to check him out. He's just there to pick up coal. He picks up some coal, he leaves. A couple more months pass, nothing exciting happens. And then one day a Spanish military ship shows up. And this is where the pucker factor kicks in because the Americans took all the weapons and the people of Guam can't defend themselves. So basically they're just going to have to switch flags again. But to their surprise, the Spanish actually didn't want to try to take over Guam again. They were just there to pick up some of their military equipment and they had permission from a U.S. Army general, at which point the new government of Guam goes, oh, that's unfortunate because we are directly under the authority of the U.S. Navy. I don't give a fuck about the U.S. Army. Get off my <laughs> island. And that, that's it. They kick the Spanish off their island and don't let them take their stuff back. And then finally, in August of 1899, another American ship shows up. The captain of that ship declares himself the military governor of Guam. And from that point forward, Guam is basically administered as if it were a U.S. warship. There is a captain in charge. He has a crew stationed with him there, earning it the nickname the USS Guam. And it would remain functioning in that fashion until 1941. <laughs> Why would that work? That works. I feel like that works really well. When I don't know. When attacked by the Japanese during World War II, and then America would reclaim it in 1944, thus adding yet another reason as to why you do wow. not fuck with America's boats. Thank That's you for crazy. Watching. Best way to support the channel That's is to go buy some merch. What a ride, dude. Um, quack, bang, <laughs> oh my out. god, dude. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, hey, real quick. Actually, I do have an announcement to make. Me and a bunch of my YouTube friends have been working on something for a long time, and it finally came out. Uh, basically, we all had the same problem. We all had monetization issues and censorship issues on a bunch of different platforms, and we were pretty much faced with two different options. We could just sit around and bitch about it and wait for somebody else to fix it, or we could go fix it ourselves. So that's what we're trying to do. We built our own streaming platform. It's called Pepperbox TV. What? This project came out way better than I ever thought it could when we started. This thing looks and feels like Netflix. It is both a website that you can stream from, and we have an app in the Apple App Store, the Android App Store, and it works on most smart TVs. Nothing's changing on YouTube. I'm going to upload everything just as I always have. But if you wanted to go check out Pepperbox.tv, when you do it, it's going to cost you $7.99 a month. And in exchange for that, you're going to get all of my videos on all of my channels ad-free 100%. Even the in-video integrations that I do are cut out as well. And for $7.99, wow. you're not just getting access to my content. You're getting access to the entire platform. We have all the content ad-free from a bunch of my friends. That's like Administrator awesome. Administrator Results, Donut Operator, Brandon Herrera, Grant Grand Thumb, Micah Mayfield, the Unsubscribed Podcast, Rich, Mr. Happy Firefighters, and a couple of other guys, and we're hopefully going to keep adding more content creators as we go. So again, nothing's changing here on YouTube. I'm still going to upload everything, but if you wanted to try it out ad-free or just check out the platform, we do have a free 14-day trial. It's available at pepperbox.tv. Hell yeah, out. man. Or don't. Up to you. Whatever. Thanks for watching. Hell yeah, man. Hang out. Oh, I'm there for it. That's awesome. Guess what, man? That's what I'm saying. Fuck yeah. You know, I love I love their unsubscribe podcast. Like it's absolutely badass. But um oh I, I hope that succeeds. I hope that catches fire and, and they can run with it. Cause that's a great I'm so I'm like proud of them for finding an alternate way to to get their, their content out there. Um because I'm pretty familiar with most of them that on, on the unsubscribe podcast. There's a couple that I really haven't done a deep dive on, but um, but anyway, guys, what you guys think of this? This is awesome. I didn't know anything about Guam, to be honest. But what do you guys think? Because this is this. I love I love these stories. These lesser known stories, honestly. Like they just they just help 
just put this crazy puzzle together that is our history here in the u.s and and it just i don't know it's just it's so unique for sure anyway much love guys make sure you unplug make sure you do something legendary and i will see you all in the next video later guys <laughs>